Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing this morning? <laughs> yeah. We just had a countdown, and all the children says, Happy New Year's. Well, Happy New Year's to y'all, too, this morning. Amen. Uh, anyway, we want to say we're so glad you all are here this morning, and we're so grateful to God for another day that he has given us his wonderful blessings. Amen. I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. It's so wonderful when the saints gather together and we come together in the name of the Lord and we are fellowshipping and strengthening one another. You know, the scripture says the more we see this day approaching when Christ is returned, we should be encouraging one another. Uh, in these times we live in, we need all the encouragement we can get. Let me say to you, I want to thank you all. Uh, as we all know, Marvin has been in the hospital for a while. I want to thank you for your prayers. He is getting much better, and so we thank God for that. Uh, and we just want to just thank you all for just the encouraging words and all that you have done. Uh, it's so good to be part of a family who is there to stand with you. Amen. And we want to just be in prayer for everyone. Uh, keep praying for one another, lifting one another up. We are so grateful to be here and so grateful to have a wonderful family like you all. Amen. Let us go before the throne of grace. Father, we come right now in the precious name of Jesus and we're so thankful that you are God who cares for your people. And in spite of what we may go through from day to day, your love is always there. You give us the strength to continue to take the next step and you fill our heart with love and faith. And we thank you this morning. We thank you that we have hope in Jesus Christ and that he is able to bring us through every situation that life brings. We're so grateful, Father, that your words say that in this life we might have troubles, or we may have troubles, or we'll have troubles. But you have overcome the world, Lord Jesus, and so we will overcome it as well. So as we look to you this morning, we ask that, our, that you would fill our hearts with praise and with joy and with peace as we thank you for all that you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, let all the saints say, Amen. Stand our feet this morning.
praise you, Lord. We give you all our worship this morning. We honor you, Lord, for you are so good to us. Praise you.
above you, no one beside you. We lift you up.
Don't get, don't get tired of praising him this morning. Don't get tired of lifting his name high this morning. Could we thank him this morning that he is faithful, that he is good, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Could we lift up a cry this morning that would thank the Father for his goodness to us? Don't get tired this morning. Don't get tired this morning. going to wait here for a moment. Father, you have the room, Lord. Would you speak in this moment, Father God? I just want to share that I feel that God is saying that there's someone you have a pain in your heart today and God wants to heal you of that pain he's still a God of miracles and he's still working miracles so if you're if you are today having a pain it doesn't have to be a physical pain it can be an emotional pain God wants to heal that pain today hallelujah hallelujah For these next few moments, could you just sing your own song to the Lord? Could you just tell him how grateful you are this morning? We don't, we don't need a, a particular melody or, or a, a, to be on the same page on a certain song. Could you just, in your own words, from your own heart, from your own experience of walking with the Lord, could you tell him how grateful you are this morning? Things may not look as good as they did yesterday, but can I tell you this morning that they will look better as you journey on with the Lord, that journeying with the Lord, even in the bad times, is better than not journeying with him in the good times that the world has to offer. And so for, for these next few moments, could you just lift his name high this morning? Could you worship him this morning in your own words? Come on. Don't let the team do all the work for you. Could you, could you worship him and lift him up in your own words this morning? Come on. Father, we thank you.
Father. We are, we are in awe of you, Father. We are just in awe and grateful, Father, that we get to step into your presence, Lord, that we don't have to jump through hoops, Father, that we don't have to uh, do anything but call on to your name and, and you are there. And so, Father, this morning, Lord, help us to be sensitive, Lord, to what you're wanting to do in this place, what you're wanting to say. Somebody has a word in the room this morning. I don't know who that is. And perhaps you've never given a word like this before, but I feel like the Lord is speaking to somebody this morning. And even now he's tugging at your heart. And we're just going to wait for just a few moments. And if you feel you have a word this morning, would you... Would you let Pastor Clinton know? We're just going to sit here for the next couple minutes. Praise the Lord. I just want to say that uh, when Moses was in the wilderness and the Lord told Moses, he said, so, Moses said, how do, I'm going to prove to the people that you spoke to me. And he told Moses, he said, what do you have in your hand? And that just kind of on my heart this morning. What do you have in your hand? And Moses says, I have a rod. And we know what God did with the rod. But when I think of the rod, I think of when the psalmist David writing said, for the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not wound. Makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. And then he goes and he said, and if I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will feel no evil for your rod. There it is, there it is, there it is, your rod. What do you have in your hand? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let me say it, the Lord is speaking to us this morning. What do you have in your hand? What is it that I have given you? What is it that I have shown you that you might know that I am the Lord thy God and that I can carry you through every situation through every pain, through every heartache, I am your God. And besides me, there is no other. Trust me, I've placed it in your hand. I've given you the miracles. I've given you the deliverance. I've given you the healing. I've given you my word. Trust me this day. Amen. Pastor Clinton was was sharing. Um, I felt the Lord show me just a picture of a. It was almost like a, a blanket or a quilt. There was a, a, a huge hole in the middle of it. And I, I just saw the quilt just begin to be just kind of sewn back together, just thread by thread, just 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 weaving. You began to see this blanket just be complete, just that hole begin to be filled in. And I felt the Lord saying this morning, I'm, I'm healing that hole that you're filling in your heart. And I feel like that's a, that's a word for somebody specific this morning, but I'm beginning to just sew that back together. I'm beginning to just fill that, that hole, that gap that you fill in your heart. I'm beginning to fill that back in. And so if that's you this morning, can I just encourage you to let the Lord do it, to let him do it. Whatever pain, whatever betrayal, whatever 
whatever hurt caused that hole in your heart, could we just begin to let that go? Could you begin to give that to the Lord? Could you begin to let him do that work on the inside of you? Father, we're grateful for your presence this morning. Oh, that always astounds me how you meet us in this place, Father. We're grateful, Father. We're, we're honored, Father, that you would meet us here week after week. And not just here, but that you would just meet us, Lord. Father, guide the rest of our time that we have together, Lord. Let us focus on you and only you as we move forward. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. And everybody said this morning, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap this morning? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, for these next few moments, if we could, would you um, just go and shake hands with somebody that you haven't seen in a while or perhaps uh, somebody new in the room? Um, and so if you, not to, not to point you out, Jesse, sorry, but, <laughs> but uh, if you would just greet each other for these next few moments. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all your beautiful faces this morning. <laughs> Those who said yes and amen, I feel like you, you know you're beautiful this morning, so it's okay. <laughs> um, well, we want to start off uh, by welcoming our visitors. Jesse, thank you so much for being with us this morning, man. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, yeah. I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's just kind of obvious that, you know, we have a visitor. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't see you behind the pole, so yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if, if you haven't already, somebody will come by and give you a visitor packet and all that good stuff. And so, um, secondly, we have um, Change for Missions, um, which we do every first of the month. Um, and that is a box here that is on that table. Um, and so what we do with that, we just bring our change. As everybody knows, we bring our change. Um, and we put it in that box, and then we use those funds to help out our mission focuses in Turkey and Belize. And then also, we're starting one in India. Did I share that with you guys already? No? Okay, so do you guys remember whispers of it? Yeah, do you guys remember Terrence? Um, he was going to start a work in Detroit. 
right? Okay, so he had some issues with his visa, and so he wasn't able to, they had begun the work in Detroit, and then they got sent back to Belize, um, and so their kind of visa paperwork just never materialized after that. Um, and so um, they've just been praying and feel the Lord is calling them to start something in India. And so um, we're going to be just praying for them and also using some of these funds as well to help support them as they begin that work in India as well. Um, and so they're still kind of in the beginning brainstorming phases of what that's going to look like. And so just be praying for them as well as they, um, you know, move forward with that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Man, would you come pray for that? Would you come pray for that, Brother Leroy? Would you come and pray for that this morning? Maybe one of those things is heartache for all of us going through this right now. First, he shared with me when I walked in the door this morning, there was seven more in the that were killed today, this morning. I mean, we have a nation that's lost his focus look like. And that was something I've been reading, and that's something I've been reading about uh, from the book of Genesis over the last number of days, uh, those that struggle with God. And it's like, we're struggling right now as a nation. It's like, what's happening with us? But Father, today we come as humble as we know how, Lord God, praying for those that have lost loved ones. I'm not talk, talking about only Turkey and Syria, but around this world we're seeing mighty moves that are taking lives away, Lord God. So, Father, we just pray your blessings over that region right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the ones that have been found alive after all these days, Lord God. We thank you for that right now. And we know that there are testimonies, Lord God, that come forth from all of these things happening in our nation and around the world, Lord God. So we do lift it all before you right now. We know you sent Jesus as our provider and, and the, the, the blessings of the songs that came so beautiful this morning, Lord God. You are our healer, oh God. So we pray a healing over this nation right now in the name of Jesus. I just listened to a report this morning where there are so many guns in our nation right now. More guns than there are people. And lives are being lost, Lord God. We don't know all the reasons why, but you know. Mental illness, whatever they may be, Lord God. So we lift these things all before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. But let us not forget those earthquake victims, Father. We could be one of those. We know, the person I know, living in San Francisco all of those years, we know what earthquakes are like and when lives are being lost, oh God. The building coming down, a freeway is coming down. So, Father, we pray over that region right now in the name of Jesus. Bring healing, Father, as only you can. And we thank you for this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. So, um, yeah, just, you know, please continue to pray, continue to lift up those nations as well, and, and, um, and, and Belize and Turkey as well. And so, um, so change for missions. Um, we also have uh, T-shirts for sale um, that say, you are so loved, both on the front in really large print, and then also in the back um, in several different languages as well. Um, and so those are $12 a piece. So if you're interested in purchasing one of those, um, please let me know, and uh, I will uh, take your payment and then bring your shirt next week as well. We have um, jackets. I believe we're going to postpone these until uh, it starts getting cold again because it's, you know, we're starting to enter spring now. So you'll use a jacket for like two weeks, and then it'll be done. So um uh, look for this uh, back up in like September, October. Um, we'll, we'll start, you know, pushing those again. Um, and so <clears throat> we have a men's event February 24th. Everyone say February 24th. Um, and this is going to be uh, in Katy uh, with uh, the members of our Katy campus as well with all the men there. It's going to be a steak night. All the men said, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be having steak. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, we're going to be getting together at one of the Katie members' homes. I, I don't know why this keeps happening, Fred, but that's my fault. Uh, but it's February 24th is the correct date. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's bring your own steak or sausage or burger patty or veggie patty, whatever, whatever it is you want to do, you can bring. Um, and uh, I believe you'll bring $5 for, to help with sides and things like that. And so if you're interested in that, scan the QR code and sign up. Um, there's going to be QR codes that pop up throughout the announcement so you can scan any of those and it'll take you to the same place to sign up and so everyone say men's event february 24th 
Coincidentally, on the same day, there's going to be a young ladies event as well on, fe on February 24th at 6 p.m. Um, so our young ladies are going to get together and have a good time. Um, also, fourth anniversary, um, February 26th, a couple days later. So we're going to have bounce houses for um, the kids. We're going to have food after service. We're going to get together, have tables and stuff after service for us to be able to fellowship and uh, uh, just have a good time together afterwards. And so if you are, have been looking for a time to invite somebody to come to church with you, February 26th is the day to do it. Um, and so please, please invite someone so we can have a packed house on that morning. Amen. And then also we have the advance happening March 11th. Uh, for those of you who haven't signed up, um, I know there's a few teenagers in the room who haven't signed up. I'm not going to point you out. But I am. Um, March 11th is going to be at our Katy campus. Um, it is. It's twenty dollars per person. That helps cover your lunch, your manual that uh, is going to come that you're going to be able to take home with you on that day. And so, if you haven't signed up for the advance, please do. If you'd like more information on what that is, what that looks like, please get with me afterwards. I'd love to get get you that info as well. Um, everyone, say grow team. This is our small group, Wednesday nights at 6.30. It is covering the testing of your faith this semester. So we'll, this started uh, early February, or early January, mid-January-ish. Anyway, so it's going to go up until like May. Um, and so, and then we'll take a break and start back up in August. And so if you're interested in that, scan, not a QR code, please let me know and we can sign you up for that. Um, and then finally, we have our marriage weekend, March 24th and 25th. Um, and this is going to be in Katy. It is 175 per couple. That covers a stay in a hotel, it covers a meal, it covers manuals and resources that you'll be able to take home with you as well. Um, and so finally, this morning, we have our tithes and offerings. Everyone say four ways to give. We have four ways to give here at Go Church Tomball. You can give online um, or you can give in person. You can give online at the link here on the, on the slide. Um, you can text your amount in as well, or you can do it the old-fashioned way. You can mail it, although you're already here, so might as well just... Do it in person or text it. So um, so this morning, we're just going to uh, pray for our tithes, and then, this, and then I'll explain what we're doing after that. And so, um, Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for um, this, this, uh, this church, Father. Thank you for um, all the people, Father, that make up this church, Lord. I, just, I thank you for their faithfulness, Father. I thank you for uh, um, their, their discipline and their good stewardship, Father. I just pray. Um, Lord, that you would just continue to uh, be faithful. Lord, I pray that you would um, just continue to guide us and show us new ways, Father, of, of how to use these resources, Father, to impact our community, Father, to impact uh, um, uh, people to come to know you, Father, and how to use these to, to make an impact for the kingdom, Father God. And so um, we just thank you so much. For everybody who, who tithes, Father, just continue to bless them. Just continue to, to, to uh, give them the means to do so, Father. And so we thank you um, for your goodness always and your mighty and holy name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So um, this morning, uh, I, I will not be sharing. This morning, everybody say, ah. I know some of you meant that, hopefully. Um, <laughs> So this morning, um, we're actually going to be streaming in from Arcady campus, um, and so it's a, we have a guest speaker this morning. Her name is John Celeste Lackin. Um, she is an award-winning author of a book called A Voice in Darkness, uh, uh, and then the second part of that is a memoir of a Rwandan genocide. So Ms. Lackin's book is a first-hand account of her fight for survival at the age of nine years old in the middle of the Rwandan genocide. Um, John is also a human rights advocate. She is passionate about the unmet needs of children, and she has founded a nonprofit organization called One Million Orphans. Um, her story was recently featured in President George Bush's new book, Out of Many, One Portrait of America's Immigrants. She shared her story on various media, such as the Today Show, NPR, KPRC, Fox News, uh, several universities and faith-based organizations, as, as well as many others. And so um, this morning, I think we had it perfectly, so Pastor Lee is actually up on stage now, and so we're going to jump right over to Katie this morning. And so y'all give it up for Pastor Lee. 
next Sunday, bring somebody. What a great Sunday. There will be moon jumps, a bouncy house back there. We have burgers for everybody, for 200 people. Bring somebody. And so it's just going to be a great, I'm working on my message already. And so uh, I, um, I'm excited about what God wants to uh, bring us next Sunday. That's next Sunday. I'm sure you'll get an email. I'm sure you'll get a text in the, uh, uh, on your phone about it. And Robin's already said it. But if you want to put up that special uh, called business meeting, that's March 1st. And uh, that picture right there is the land that we are pursuing. Andrew is a surveyor. So let me just give you, uh, according to our bylaws, that our council has to decide yes, and then we call after two weeks a special called business meeting to vote on the land. So it'll be about a 15-minute meeting, um, and so it's about less than a mile away. It's uh, a part of an 80-acre plot of land that the owners are willing to cut out five acres for us at a, an amazing price. You cannot get that for what we are paying for it. And it's really, uh, when we were talking to the realtor, she said, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And I said, I am looking for a needle in a haystack. And we think we found it. And so, um, should we say God found it? And so... So pray for us. Our, our intention would be to make plans over 2024 and break ground in 2025 as we go to two services here, allow our, ourselves to grow as we build over there and get into a place of our, of our permanent place. March 1st, we had already scheduled a special called business meeting. And last night I got an email from the Churches of Katy and said, would your church be willing uh, to partner with all the other churches in Katy to have a night of worship as we see God is doing something unique in our world that there's an awakening of his kingdom coming. Could Katy be a part of that journey? And so instead of us gathering all the churches in the one location, they said, could all the churches meet? And so there'll be some, some bullet points, but really the focus is just seeking the face of God. And so right after the special called business meeting, the business meeting, I think, is at 6.30. At 7, we'll come into a time of just seeking his face with no other agenda except to just seek his face, to surrender to him, to wait on what he's doing. So I'm super excited about that. I me emailed directly back and said, yes, <laughs> we will do it. And so... Um, I thought I had one other thing to say. Uh, yes, if you are married, we would love you to go to the marriage enrichment. It is uh, super important that you invest your time. In fact, don't call Robin and I this afternoon unless someone's like in critical sh shape because Robin and I are getting out of town. Say so, woohoo! And so. <laughs> And did you hear my kids? They're like, yeah, they love it when we leave. You know, they party. And so uh, uh, they said, please don't leave town until we have a Monday off so we can stay up late and have a good time without y'all. And so, um, but we are getting out of town. And then pray, and, and this is the last thing I'll say before I move on. Pray for me, but this Asbury University, as I said, I've just been captivated by what God is doing. And so I had intended to fly out right after March 1st on March 2nd to Asbury. Barry, just to spend a day in his presence. This is sense what God is doing. I'm not sure if it will be at Asbury on March 2nd, so I'm not sure what I'm doing, but pray for me that as your pastor that what he is doing, I would hear and obey and lead us in where he wants us to go. That's who I want to be for y'all. I want to be your shepherd. Um... I want to pastor well, and I best do that when I'm in tune with him, and so pray for me on that. All right, all right. Let me tell you all this good stuff. All right. Miss Jean Celestine Lacken is an award-winning author of a book called The Voice in the Darkness, a memoir of the Rwandan genocide. Jean is also a human rights advocate passionate about the unmet needs of children. Jean founded a nonprofit organization, One Million Orphans. If you've never read the book, they're out there. We'll tell you a little bit more about that later. I would highly encourage you to read it. Best way I can describe it is powerfully painful to read the journey. It was one of those books that I wept through every chapter, but I couldn't 
put it down, I had to read the next scenario of the journey. Her book is about her lost innocence in the fight for survival in the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi people. A Voice in the Darkness memoir of the Rwandan genocide survivor, Ms. Lacken's book is first-hand account of her, fl uh, her fight for survival at the age of nine years. Jeanne obtained her master's degree in public administration and public policy from Eastern Washington University in 2012. If you don't know much about the Rwandan genocide, one million people were massacred, were murdered in 100 days. We're not talking 100 years ago. We're talking 20 years ago. Um, I also read that after the genocide, another 5 million people died in the surrounding countries because of the guerrilla warfare, the instability of the nations around it that it had caused. If you want to read more or get a visual more of what we're talking about today, go and rent uh, the, the movie Rw uh, Hotel Rwanda. It's an account of a hotel during the genocide, and it gives a good account of what's going on. Another movie, and when John came the first time, we watched both of these as preparation for her coming. Uh, Beyond the Gate is another story. If I remember correctly, it's of a Catholic priest and a, uh, a home, an educational facility that endured the genocide and all that. I would highly encourage, I don't know what they're rated <laughs> um, um, because of the gore, but it gives a um, a healthy understanding of what our world endured during that time. By the age of 18, uh, by the age of 14 years, Miss Lacken was attending an American school, trying to learn English and struggling to cope with what she endured during the genocide, the abuse suffered during years spent as an orphan in Rwanda. John's story was recently featured in President Bush's uh, new book. I believe there is a picture. Um, I don't believe that's the right PowerPoint. So that's not, that's from the last time. Um, that is the wrong PowerPoint. And, and she's saying, come on. Um, I'll give them a second to, to put, I'd like to show you those pictures in just a second. Um, She's also a wife to Paul and a mommy to Sammy. And so uh, we're gonna, I'm going to give them a, just a second to pull, pull these pictures up. I definitely want to show you the book. She was in the book called Out of Many One, and George, President George Bush uh, wrote that book, and he wrote it to celebrate immigrants who have come to America and have prospered. And if you know anything about President George Bush, he's not only a uh, former president, but he's also an artist. And so he painted their pictures, and Jean has uh, one of those chapters and one of those paintings uh, in, in there. And so, um, would you give it up to Jean and I'll have her come up and they'll, they'll pull off those slides. All right. All right. I, I, I'm going to pause here because I don't, I, I want the people to be able to see this and I, I, I can't blame it on RJ because there was two PowerPoints in my sermon slide, one from, from the, when you came last time and the other one's the new one. So that's how they pulled up the wrong one. So, but I'm going to give it some time. Will it take a few minutes for y'all to download it into the Pro Presenter? Two minutes? Two seconds. One. Your God, two. this. Give it up for RJ and Carolina when they're under pressure. We refine them under pressure. All right, all right, all right. It's coming. Right there, that's it. Well, you can just stop there. Do, let me just kind of walk you through those. That's your book. Um, we'll talk to you more about that. Go on to the next one. 
All right, that's Rwanda. That's during the genocide, the people fleeing the country towards the end. If you wonder where Rwanda is, that's right there in the map. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, yeah, I was talking about, if you haven't seen the movie, that is Ho Hotel Rwanda. I uh, highly encourage you to watch that. Go ahead to the next slide. And uh, Beyond the Gates is the other movie I talked to you about. Next slide. And that is uh, her being interviewed by President George Bush. And this is the p picture that he painted for her and interviewed. You can go to the next slide. And those are some of the pictures she has with him. And that was fairly recently, a year ago, year and a half ago. So, And next slide. It's just some of the pictures of her uh, speaking globally around the world on these causes. I think we have one more. All right, and do we have one more? All right, that's her beautiful family. And so, all right. So last time you were here, for y'all that don't know, she was here three years ago. Our first year as a church, we were meeting at Katie High School, uh, Katie Junior High. And... Um, I met Jean, uh, we were talking, she works at Lone Star uh, College, and we were talking about one of my daughters, and uh, telling her that we're from, she was from Belize, and da-da-da, and Jean says, well, you need to hear my story, I'm from Rwanda, and so as we begin to talk, she immediately realized this is a believer we're talking to, and I'm like, you need to come to my church, and so um, that's what she did, and it was a powerful time, and most of that time was spent on telling stories uh, of her journey in Rwanda. And I want to spend a little bit of time there so you will get an understanding of where we're wanting to go with today. But I'm really looking for kind of a what I what I term a cliff note version of the journey because it really does set the stage for why you have such a voice. Um, on the message of forgiveness. And so your book, A Voice in the Darkness, captures your horrific journey, painful to read. For those who haven't read it, could you share uh, a story from that book that just kind of gives them an understanding of that journey? So. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me one more time. Um, they've been, thank you. Pastor Lee and his family has just became like a family, the body of Christ. You feel, you just sense this love in the community. Uh, there are so many people here in a church who have also followed me on, you know, social media, who we have phone calls together. So you have been a family in a way that you cannot imagine. So I'm very grateful that I'm coming back. Um, I want to confess something really quick before we begin. I have beautiful notes. I was thinking last night and I just took notes. I have verses um, that I wanted to share. But when you know how God works, it's just so magical. He made me forget them, so I didn't need them. <laughs> Got in the car, I told my husband, Paul, I said, uh-oh, almost now halfway, just very close. He's like, do you want to go back? I was like, no, I'm just going to let God do what God does. So what are you about to hear? Whatever that comes in my, in my mouth. I, and I have a terrible memory, so you know. So I'm going to let the Holy Spirit really speak through me. Whatever he has for you, it's, just, it's going to be the way he wants this message to come out. So a little bit about my journey. Um, I was born in Rwanda in a very loving family. The love that I remember is something that shaped who I am as a, a child. It's something that really the person I am today had a whole lot to do with the way I was raised. My parents really embodied Christ. They embodied humanity. The way they treated one another. A lot of people, they will tell you a story of this is what needs to be done. This is how, it's just like a spoken word. My parents did the work. Watch them just visiting people at the hospitals, a visit, you know, taking food and taking it to the people who were poor in our communities, putting kids in school, uh, visiting orphans, buying them clothes. Uh, my father was uh, known as uh, a mediator, somebody who was elected in a community to be, basically, if there was any type of conflicts, he would be the person to kind of hash out that disputes between people, whether it's about land and relationships. 
And so there was this like respect in a community that I watched as a child and I just loved the way they portrayed the love of Christ without saying the words. And so I was again surrounded by so much love. Um, when the genocide took place, we went from having, and I, I grew up in a family where basically we had, as children, my parents were business people, they had you know, enough resources, not only to take care of us, but also to take care of uh, the rest of the, the community. And so when the genocide takes place, we go from living in a beautiful home, having everything a child could have dreamed of, to basically living in the bushes, in the swamps. But one of the most beautiful things that I'm you know, very grateful for, the title of my book, A Voice in the Darkness. And I wanna kinda spend a little bit of a minute talking about that voice. There were times, because I, I was in the bushes with my three-year-old twin sisters, but there was this voice that I felt as a kid, and the Holy Spirit is real. When you pray and you believe, God really has a way of communicating to you and you just know in your God that this is real. There's times where God just will say to me, move from this bush, go to the next. Move from this swamp, go to this other place. And there was other moments where I would be walking in front of the people with machetes and clubs and I hear this voice that said, these whispers. I said, hold your head high, go forward. I mean, I am shaken like a leaf. Inside of me, everything is just, I am afraid. But this voice, this inner whisper in my spirit that says, hold your head high. You're walking in front of people with machetes and clubs, with blood stain on their clothes and their machetes. But God said, hold your head high, walk straight. And I trusted. And in the middle of the genocide, over and over again, as a child, uh, as a nine-year-old, I began saying this prayer because I felt like it worked once. And I said, okay, God, if it worked once, I'm just gonna do the same thing for the next event. The next barrier, the next attack, and that simple prayer was, God, blind them that they might not see me. Yes. Yes. Amen, amen. Blind them, a simple prayer of a child. Now I'm a grown up and I'm an old lady, but I look back on the things that I was able to do, how I was able to navigate this. It was God making just, and some of you might think that you don't have what it takes. We don't have to have what it takes. We don't have to have the formula. If you have Jesus in you, if you allow God to lead you, he will equip you with whatever that you need in the moments you need him. Sorry, Pastor Lee, that was a long um, response to that. But really, the love that I saw growing up is what shaped who I am. Is, uh, I just felt like it carried me through. Um, the strength from Jesus is what carried me through up to this day. How long were you in the bush? Um, Almost three months. Three months. Um, her father and mother were murdered, and her uh, mother's newborn baby, your brother, um, who was... Three weeks old. Uh, three weeks old, um, on her mother's body, and, and were murdered with her mother. And so you see that it's not just a genocide that happened in her nation, but it happened very much to her family. And so, uh, how did you get to the U.S.? Um, if I come, talk about coming to U.S., I want to share really quick, um, a quick story of, um, so this genocide happened, my, uh, many of you, if you are a daddy's girl, daddy, my, our son is a daddy's boy, I get jealous of that relationship. Um, <laughs> But if you're daddy's girl, when I watch my father being hacked with machetes and clubs, and I want to share that story a little bit more because I want you to, when I, we talk about forgiveness, I want you to understand, I loved my dad more than I loved anything in the world. If you're again a daddy's girl, daddy's boy, you know, I walked around my father asking random questions. 
I just trusted him. He was my hero. And to watch him being slaughtered in the streets with machetes, that just made my spirit crushed. That made me have so much resentment and anger in my heart. And then I saw my beautiful mother's dead body uh, at one point in the genocide and, and the three week old. And when you talk about the genocide, these people were just brutal. They didn't spare anyone. It was just, you saw, a lot of times I say, I feel like I went in hell and came back. Because the things that I witnessed, the things I saw, the voices of women being you know, raped, the children being raped and killed, it's something that you don't wish any child to see, but no grown-up should see and experience that. But how I came to the United States, my parents are dead. I was taken in the Congo, because now you have people who have participated in the genocide. Now, go, they knew that the new government that was coming in, the, the, the people who have been in uh, exile, the Tutsis, were coming to take over the country. And they were afraid of being basically persecuted for the crimes against humanity that they have committed. So there's a man who kept me in his home at the end, almost at the end of the genocide, sexually abused me. Verbally, physically, I mean, you name every abuse in the book, he just, he took his way and just, psh. So he takes me to Congo, he separates me with my uh, tw three-year-old twin sisters, he takes me to Congo, and it was in the Congo where he's actually deciding that I was going to be sold in marriage at a 10-year-old. And as I'm hearing again the discussion about how much money that I was worth, I say, look, God, you did not bring me this far to die here, to be sold at 10 years old. No way. And so I ran away, and I actually came back to Rwanda. Pastor Lee, forgive me. There's a quick story that I want to sneak in between that one. So over and over in the genocide, I witnessed so many times, so almost countless times where I was actually going to die. But I wanna share this story about how I was about to cross over in the Congo, right before we got into the Congo. There was this river, Nyabarongo. And in the refugee camp with these like, uh, people who have participated in the genocide or migrating with their families, there was this one time, it was multiple times, over and over again, they're killing people, they're throwing their bodies in the, the people who are identified as Tutsis. They're throwing their bodies in the river, men, women, and children. And at one point, they discovered me. I was just looking for the little branches of trees, covering myself cook, you know, for cooking twigs and so forth. And I tried to hide my face because, and then they st these people started saying, She's a Tutsi, get her, get in line. Just like everybody else that they have been killing. And I tried to ignore the voices, but the, the voices grew louder and louder and louder, and there was no more ignoring. I knew they were just pointing at me. I knew the, the eyes were just right on me. Finally, I made it to the line. I got in line with everybody else. And again, they're killing every single one of them and they throwing them in the river. And I'm watching this line just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it, they get to me. It was my turn. They threw my body on the ground, just like everybody else, right before me. And I don't know if it's a, a sense of dying, but everything in that moment just became quiet. It's almost like you could hear a needle drop. Everything would just calm. It's almost like everybody stopped moving. Even the people were chanting to kill me. It's almost like they stopped. And I hear this woman in this quiet moment, I hear this woman who said, she's screaming and she said, that's my daughter. That's my child. I'm thinking to myself, this poor woman have lost her child and she's going to walk in here and she's going to look at my face and then go, oopsie, that's not my daughter, disappointed and she's going to walk away. But this woman comes in, she looks at me and she said, that's my child. And there's this warmth, because at that time I knew 
my mother had been killed. And this woman is claiming me to be her child. And I'm just kind of shut down, I mean, be quiet and just go with it. Immediately, I'm gonna borrow a lady really quick, Pastor Lee. Do we have another church coming after this? <laughs> no? Yeah, Yo, you're gonna miss your lunch, but forgive me, let's do this really quick. Come here, sister. I'm gonna bore you, you're gonna be, in, for a minute, you're gonna be in my, yes please. She's gonna, pr she's gonna play my angel mama for a minute. So these men are looking at me, they look at her, they're shaking their heads. I am scared, I am afraid. I know if she said this, if something changed in her and say, mm-mm, nah, my child, they're just gonna slaughter me right there. But she said, no, this is my daughter. They picked me up, they threw me right in her hands, and then they looked at us again and then they decided that they would actually separate us. They took me on one side, they took her on the other side. In Rwanda, you had to carry racial identity, identification, just like we have our driver's license here. It will have your age, it will have your children's names and the ages, the birthdays. So they asked her a series of questions and everything had to match her racial identity card. And what's surprising, it's not a surprise to God. Everything, my age, my name, and the other thing that's surprising, instead of telling them my official name, I told them my first name, Jean, and my nickname, which is, that is girl. And that's why I was in her identification card. They brought me back and threw me right in her hands, and they said, go. And as I was walking with this beautiful woman, flawless, I'm just dying to ask her questions. Like, who are you? I mean, we're not gonna do that here, but I'm just dying to ask her, when we get far away from these people, who are you? And then she looks at me and she said, my child, go with these people. I'm like, ah, oh, go with these people? I wanna go with you. I didn't say, tell her that, but she said, go with these people. I will be with you. I will protect you. And she released my hand. Thank you. She releases my hand. Give her a hand clap. <laughs> she released my hand. And then I look back. And she disappeared. Now, friends. <laughs> If nothing else, just know that God works. He will rescue. He won't fail you like that song. He will not fail you. Whatever you're walking through today, it might be a medical report, it might be marriage, it might be finances, he will not fail you. I believe in that moment God brought another angel to save my life. And ever since, I know when it gets hard, I'm like, you know what, God? You've done the other stuff. The rest you can do too. Yeah. It's good. We can skip some questions. <laughs> no, it's powerful. So here's the question. How did you come to forgive the people who were so evil to you. So let me give you a couple of scriptures. Matthew chapter 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Colossians chapter 3, 13 says, Bearing with one, one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That's the word. That's a whole lot harder to do in practicality, especially from what you went through. Spill, uh, walking through such horrific trauma, how did you forgive such evil people that did evil things to your life and your family? You know, uh, C.S. Lewis says that forgiveness is a lovely thing until we have to forgive. 
It really is. We want to talk about forgiveness until we are put in a position to really, truly forgive. And there's a forgiveness that says, I forgive you. I don't want to see your face. We just, we're good. We're all right. That's not a true forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness that the Bible is talking about, the Bible says, forgive and pray and bless. Now that's tough, but I want to tell you this. My uh, sweet mother used to, both actually both my parents, as children will have disputes among ourselves from a family of 10, they're going to be fights. Mm -hmm. You're going to be fighting over toys, things, clothes, you name it. There will be something, and it was constant. But my mother had a way of explaining forgiveness in a way that I understood as a child. She would say that if there was any sort of like negative feeling in your heart, if there was resentment towards your siblings because the things they've done to you, God is not going to hear your prayers. And I thought, okay, then I'm just going to suck it up and forgive them anyways. <laughs> Even if we don't want to. But as a child, after the genocide, I really felt that God had saved me from chaos. And I felt like I was sinking into this darkness of pain. There was a moment of running, moments of running in the genocide where I felt like, okay, it's survival. But when the aftermath, everything just came crumbling. Everything just sunk in. Resentment, pain, and anger. It just felt like I was somehow, the way I see it, it was almost like I, there was these stairs going down in, a, in, a, in the darkness in a dungeon. And uh, instead of coming up and seeing the light, I was just descending even more and more and more because of the pain that I've experienced. And friends, I want to share this with you. The enemy takes the opportunity to use the pain that we've experienced, whether it's something that somebody has said about you, whether it's the pain that people have caused us, to use it as an excuse to not an excuse, but also to torture us even deeper, to torment us. There is God say, forgive them so I can forgive you. And there is the enemy that gives you every excuse, every reason why what happens to you is justified. The reason why you should be spending nights and days just being bitter. So which voice you want to listen to? I can tell you this, when things happen to you, um, when things have been said about you, when people have harmed you, and the enemy is using that to really make it even worse because you're not sleeping, you're thinking about that somebody who has done wrong to you. And some people are mad at people who have been dead. And that's just so sad. Because the enemy is robbing your joy, your potential. A lot of times I like to call this uh, Pastor Lee, like it's a fight for your calling. I was speaking at a high school just recently and, and I'm not sure how, what I'm going with this. Maybe the Holy Spirit has a, a way of like, wrapping this up in a minute. Bear with me. I'm speaking at a, at a community college and I asked the student, I said, Do you ha what's your purpose? How many of you feel like you have a purpose? And a third of the room raised their hands. And I was like, this, this college is in trouble. I'm not going to tell you which college it was. But the minute you lose your purpose, the minute you feel like you have no purpose, you've lost hope. And that's what the enemy wants you to, to do. Because he's going to use all that ugliness to excuse why. And again, you continue to be tormented because you have, you're holding on to this bitterness, to this anger. And so for me, I prayed. I was like, okay, God, you ask me to forgive. You ask us to forgive. And I've already tried by myself to forgive, and I just can't do it. I don't have it in my bones. I can't forgive the sexual abuse that I endured. I can't forgive how, what, the pain of my parents, watching my parents, almost my entire family being wiped out. 
So I got real with God. I said, because I don't have it in me, I need your strength. I need you to pour in me what I don't have. And that's the ability, the gift, the power of forgiveness. And when you pray that prayer, friends, God is going to answer. And when he does, you better be prepared to see what else he's going to ask you to do because he doesn't just, it doesn't end there. When I forgive, I seriously, like I told you, I felt like I was descending into this darkness. I felt like I was so free. I felt like I, I was like this eagle flying high up in the sky. I felt like I could taste the sun like on my skin, the flowers, the things that, of peace and joy that I was seeing before that wasn't even enjoyable. I started enjoying those things. That's the gift that God wants you to experience. The unforgiveness, it equals ter torment. The enemy wants you to hold on to it, somehow to justify it, but that's the way the enemy wants you to keep you from, I mean, also, unforgiveness causes our body to be sick. I remember once I forgave, truly forgave, God said, and I didn't know then in the Bible that there was this verse uh, that said, pray for them and bless them. God immediately, almost in the same sentence, he said, pray for them and bless them. And I struggled with that. I said, pray and bless them? I said, forgiving them is one thing, God. <laughs> but to bless? But I want to share this with you. When you pray and bless the people who have harmed you, you're actually praying that somehow God will put in their hearts the understanding of the pain that they have caused you. When you bless them to enjoy the blessing of God, they will get to know him the same way that you know him. Amen. You said something, uh, and I want to put it out because I believe it's something that God's speaking to us in this hour. It's even somewhat, I'll talk about it a little bit next Sunday on our anniversary Sunday, that we can't do it on our own. Amen. You had to ask Jesus to give me the strength. Um, it's the whole notion of salvation that we cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. Um, there's a, for y'all that have been watching The Chosen, did we just watch eight, Erica, or seven? Eight, eight's the last one of the series. And it ends, and I, try, I, I won't try to give it away to you, but it ends when Jesus and Peter walks on the water. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. It's a powerful moment. And Jesus calls Peter out of the boat, and Jesus continues to cry, look at me, look at me, just look at me. And when Peter got his all eyes off of Jesus, he began to go into the water. And then Jesus grabbed him back up. And it's just such a powerful moment of Jesus clinging to Peter. And he said, just look at me. Your message of forgiveness is in your own strength, you can't do it. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. Um, there are people in this room that have hurts and pains and you have tried in your own strength to forgive. Perhaps today is a day that you need to say, I lay it at the feet of Jesus because I can't do it in my own strength. I won't ask all these questions, but I have one that I feel is important. Sometimes when we go through such horrific pain, we blame God. So it's... How did you um, keep your heart open with peace and love and not bitterness and anger and resentment toward God? That's a good question, really. I, I really felt that because in the genocide, God wasn't participating. The people he gave the free will were the participants. That's right. 
And so when you are maybe at your work or in school or in an environment where you feel like you're being targeted, there are some people who the enemy uses to cause us so much pain. And we blame God. But we know that the enemy is at work. And anything to disrupt our peace, God is present. He's going to use. So really there was no resentment towards God because I saw God in these whispers of God over and over and over again. I just felt like they were real. God is real. Yeah. And I want to remind people, sometimes they, they might be, I don't know what, where we're going with this again, sometimes you might have not forgiven yourself. Right. But you know what? There's not a sin in the world it's nothing you could do or have done that God cannot forgive. That's right. Sometimes we hold ourselves hostage. And I think that was for somebody that I had no idea where that came from, but I had to say that, Pastor. I, I'm being obedient. I, th I think your answer is, is right on. And I think sometimes we get angry at God because of our bad theology. Um, because when God is in control of everything. It means he dictates everything. Um, he pre predetermined, we've talked about this, Calvinism and Arminianism, then it is God's fault. But when we understand that humanity has a free will, um, then that wasn't God's fault. That was human's free will that made really bad choices and misguided. And earlier, and ever since I said it, I, I've just felt the Holy Spirit say it. You need to go back there. I, I asked the question, how did you handle evil men? We are all inherently evil <laughs> broken and so they did evil things but they were broken men misguided um, by the lives of the enemy so and as you said God can even forgive them which really leads to all what we just said really leads to one of our last questions it says not that God caused the genocide it wasn't God's fault it was the enemies but share with us how God is redeeming evil in your personal story really quick Pastor Lee so I don't I feel like there's a is the verse in the Bible and I want you guys to uh, look it up if you if you haven't already it's in Romans 12 verse 19 to 21 that says that let vengeance, let God just be in control of that. Let us just be the, you know, when you, somebody has harmed you, let God take care of them. Because if we try to take care of them, we're not going to win. But if you let God take care of it, you can move forward and just enjoy his blessing. Um, ask me that question one more time. My brain went somewhere. I apologize. <laughs> I said, not that God caused the genocide. It wasn't God's fault. It was the enemy's fault. But share with us how God is redeeming evil in your personal story. Amen. I love that. Uh, I love that question. I, I was uh, sharing with Pastor Lee as we were walking in. They're just the most beautiful thing God has been able to do in my life, the way he has been able to use me in settings where um, I walk into these places and people go, how did you make it in here? Because I don't have the big titles. But when you allow God, when you are able to forgive, God really has a way of taking our mess into a message. God has a way of taking our pain into a purpose. So I have been in, in settings where, I mean, even like being a good friend of President Bush, me, that child that was orphaned, homeless in, in, in the cities of Rwanda, just with nothing. But there was always in my heart that somehow God is going to work this thing out. All I have to do is just continue to pray and say, God, you got this. And I continue to do that. I've been able to work on human rights uh, issues. In fact, I'm going to New York um, in next month where we'll be talking about women's rights. Uh, there's another picture that you showed there. I was uh, in Vienna. And a really quick story being in Vienna, you just I was in a room of, yeah, yeah that one on the left, Vienna Migration Conference. Um, 
being in a room in that room reminded me that my background I had no business being in that room a lot of people again kept asking me what part of organization are you a part of uh, what's your title I'm like none <laughs> I'm just a regular normal mommy here <laughs> But it's, uh, I'm sharing that to, not to brag, but to really show you how God can use us. God doesn't need you to have degrees. That God doesn't need you to be equipped. But if he equips you, if you let him really play into you the purpose he has for you. And I think this is where I was going with, with this story about having a purpose. Many of us are fighting battles, and we don't know why. Think about in the Bible. Think about how many people God used without going through training, spiritual training. They have gone through a lot. God is preparing you for his purpose. God is preparing you as you go through these struggles. God is preparing you to do his work, to use you. How many of you feel like you have a calling over your, over your life? I want to see everybody. If you still have some air in your lungs, God is going to use you. So if you're going through rough time, tough things, God is, it's like, it's like that seed. The seed doesn't just like, you know, you, you don't just put a seed here and then somehow it grows. It has to be buried. And you know, I've been buried. And that's why God is using me. I walked into the room uh, in one of those pictures with President Bush when he was uh, interviewing me. We were speaking with young professionals. And one of the questions he asked me, which sort of like shocked me, said, he said to me, he said, what if the man who raped you would walk into this room, what would you do? Because he knows about, he was very intrigued with my story, uh, my ability to forgive. They're very good Christian family, by the way. They're just loving and kind. But when he asked me that question, what would you do if the man who raped you walked into these doors? I said, look, President Bush, we are humans. We get to feel angry. We get reminded of the pain. and we, Our brain might take us back. But we have to, I have to go back to the same source and say, God, help me forgive this man who has abused me. And so we don't forgive once. Sometimes we have to forgive over and over and over and over again. And I apologize. I don't know how I no. ended up there. No. So what a great moment to begin to end. Sometimes forgiveness requires over and over and over and got to forgive and a year later something else crops up and, and it is a process. Don used to talk about it's like an onion. You peel one layer back, there's another layer underneath there. It's a process of forgiveness. We teach that in our advance that is coming up in a couple of weeks. And so uh, think about this lady. She is traveling the world. She has a voice among some powerful people around the world, uh, presidents, and uh, she gets to speak the message of forgiveness. Such a contrary word to the world, but it's a very relevant word to the believer to walk in. Um, could we pray for you? Um, could we pray that uh, just favor and so could we do that could you just stretch your hands out Father we pray for Jean we pray for Paul Father we thank you for her message to us we thank you that she had the God I don't know the call it a weakness or strength <laughs> the ability to say, I can't do it on my own, to lay it at your feet, to allow you to heal, to allow, to give her the strength to forgive. Father, thank you for giving her favor with um, people around the world. She's in forums and meetings that you have opened the door for. Father, I ask that, Father, you would continue to give her favor. You would put people in her life 
that need to hear her story, that you would impact them, that men and women would come to know you as Lord and Savior because of her story, God. God, we ask that you would bless her. Thank you for teaching us through her this morning. Would you give it up for Jean? Would our leaders make their way up? I want to read this to you. There is no wrong that cannot be forgiven through Jesus. You see, Jean's had something extremely difficult to forgive. In 1994, her parents, her infant brother, and most of her relatives were massacred during the Rwandan genocide, which claimed the lives of a million people in a hundred days. She was beaten, abused, starved, nearly killed, set to be sold in the marriage as a child and ultimately God spared her but for a long time she suffered until she accepted the unconditional love and the infinite comfort of a savior named Jesus her story is a message of forgiveness it's a story of redemption as well that God is using what the enemy meant for evil the enemy meant to destroy her life and he tried many times to do so but God is turning that story around to minister to you and the minister to thousands of more maybe you're in this place this morning and you need to forgive maybe you have some hatred to some people that have harmed you and Jesus is saying to you today give it to me if that's you would you come maybe your relationship with Jesus is not where it's been and where it needs to be and today is a message to come If I could get our leaders to come up to the front and Shakespeare. What a powerful story this morning. Um, I feel it's a story for us in the room that should provoke something in us that should move us this morning. And... This morning before we close, man, perhaps you feel the Holy Spirit just speaking to you in this room. Today is, it's not just a day about hearing a tragic story. It's not just about hearing the testimony of this lady. It's about what is God speaking in my life this morning based off of what I've heard this morning? How does God's goodness, how does his redeeming ability how does this, all of this, how do we move to action hearing all of this? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you in these moments? Is it about forgiveness? Is the Holy Spirit asking you to perhaps forgive someone in your life? Perhaps he's speaking to you about forgiving yourself this morning. Perhaps you have a need in this room. You just need somebody to pray with you. You just need somebody to hug you. You just need to cry for a few moments, man. Could I invite you this morning to come? This altar is open. Holy Spirit is in this place. So as our team sings for a few moments, could you come? Could you come? Holy Spirit, would you speak loud and clear in these moments? Help us to block out distraction. 
Help us to hear what you're wanting to say to us right here, right now. Help us to not miss what you're wanting to do in this place. This altar is open.